Welcome back, everyone. Sorry for the glitches there for a moment. Um, so we are back for our last talk of the day, and I have just ceremonially cracked open the um, one of the many NorthSec beers. Uh, this is the last one that remained in my apartment. So uh, I'm very excited to welcome this next uh, speaker. She spoke last year at NorthSec and was a really well-received talk. Um, and the talk is going to be Designing Customer Account Recovery in a 2FA World uh, by Kelly Robinson. Kelly works on the account security team at Twilio. Previously, she worked in a variety of API platform and data engineering roles at startups. Her research focuses on authentication, user experience, and design trade-offs for different risk profiles and 2FA channels. Kelly lives in Brooklyn, is an avid home cook, and spends too, way too much time on Twitter. I'm sorry, I editorialized with the way too much time. Apologies. It was just too much time. <laughs> she tweets at Kelly Robinson. Um, yeah, please give her a virtual... Hand of applause. Uh, welcome, Kelly. Excited for this. Cheers. Thank you. Disappointed that I do not have one of those beers as well, but I will be ceremoniously cracking one up after I give this talk. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, thank you for sticking around to the end of the day and for this talk. Uh, I can tell you the exact moment that I was inspired to give this talk. Uh, like a lot of things in security, the user experience is one of the most important parts and getting that balance right between usability and necessary friction is always something that we're going to have to keep in mind. And so when I tried to reset my password for this website and they told me that resetting the password would just deactivate my two-factor authentication, I was a little upset. Uh, but I think that this whole balance of usability and friction is especially true with authentication because it's one of the most common security measures that everybody deals with. And we deal with it on a repeated basis. We're logging into websites repeatedly day after day, uh, into multiple websites every single day. And so this is something that everybody kind of around the world is dealing with and is familiar with. And so we as security professionals have to be designing these systems in a way that makes sense. Uh, so no one expected to be quarantined for a good chunk of 2020, but I think one of the outcomes of this is that we're all doing a lot more business online, and that makes it increasingly important to shore up our online authentication and think about how we're allowing customers to regain access to their accounts. So I'm going to be sharing some of the things that I think are good options for designing account recovery when users have 2FA enabled. I'm specifically calling out customer account recovery here because I think there's a different way of thinking about this problem for user facing applications compared to something like internal employee account recovery. So I'm going to focus on consumer applications and end user security. So my name is Kelly Robinson. I have been working at Twilio for about three years. I specifically support Twilio's account security products for things like user verification and phone intelligence. Uh, this team has been evolving a lot since uh, it was acquired. Uh, so the Authy team was acquired by Twilio about five years ago. Authy is our free consumer application for 2FA that you may be a user of. And this talk is going to incorporate both a lot of the things that I've learned from working on security products for the last few years, uh, working with our developers and our customers on their authentication challenges, but also some of the things that we've learned from running a two-factor authentication product and a product that has an account recovery option, a product that has a lot of security uh, considerations that we have to make around recovery and how that affects our customers that are using it. Uh, if you're watching this uh, uh, in a logged in Twitch account, Twitch is a Authy customer. Uh, so you, if you set up 2FA with Twitch, that you're going to be using Authy for that. And I can tell you that when Twitch users need to reset their, uh, their two-factor authentication, um, you know, they're dealing with our support team and uh, our support team are very, very lovely people. And, you know, we have to make a lot of considerations around how to make sure that people can get back into their Twitch accounts without uh, having those accounts taken over. 
So of course we hope that users don't lock themselves out of their accounts, but there's a lot of common reasons that uh, we have to take into account when we're designing these systems and when we're designing account recovery. Uh, people forget passwords, that's a common one. Uh, they change their phone numbers, that's also common, especially in cases where two-factor authentication involves a phone number, which a lot of cases do. Uh, people lose devices, that could be an authenticator application or a physical hardware security key, or they you know, upgrade to the latest iPhone. Maybe they don't lose something, but they're getting a new device and they forget that there was anything important on that old device. Um, but we have to figure out how to address these issues while still guarding against attackers and guarding against account takeover attempts. And addressing this is expensive. Uh, this can cost companies up to $70 per support call to unlock an account. Uh, and so we have to be thinking about how we can minimize this cost while still protecting user accounts. So one thing I wanted to look at was the different factors that we have access to and how we can evaluate using these factors for account recovery. And one thing to note is that the more of you, these that you collect when the user first signs up, uh, the more that you'll have to trust and verify against when they attempt an account recovery. So generally, and I'll be walking through more concrete recommendations towards the end of the talk, but generally, even if you're having a user log in with two factors, you probably want to be collecting at least three factors at some point during an authenticated session so that they can make sure that they can log in with at least two factors if they lose one of the ones that they were using. So let's start with looking at some of the knowledge factors or things that you would know. And these could be passwords, security questions, or specific account information. And these could be things like recent transactions or hopefully uh, other secret details about the account. Uh, knowledge factors are great because they're easy to use and to set up and they can't exactly be lost. Uh, the reason security questions became so popular as a recovery mechanism is because things like your mother's maiden name or the name of your first pet, those aren't things that are going to change and you'll likely remember those details. However, uh, knowledge factors like passwords can of course be breached and uh, many security questions or account details could be searched. It's not impossible to find the street that someone grew up on or guess the color of their first car. Uh, and so humans of, are of course uh, forgetful. So anything like a password could also be lost that way. Uh, looking at inherence factors or things that you are, like your fingerprints, your voice, or even the way that you type or another way to identify you. Uh, the benefits of these is that you can't lose or forget these, but the downside is that you can't really change these. Uh, so the risk is really high for these getting breached, which makes uh, implementation of inherence factors de delicate, I would say. And it's a big reason that these aren't widely supported. Um, so if you saw the fingerprint cloning talk from earlier, you also meet, know that these can be cloned, which is very scary. But moving on to possession factors, these are something that you have. Um, these tend to be more secure than passwords because they can be harder to fish and don't get leaked in data breaches. Uh, so these could be things that you have like your phone, um, backup or recovery codes, and hardware security tokens like YubiKeys. Uh, of course, when it comes to something you have, uh, people are people, we're all human, and we tend to lose and replace things. And that means it's hard to guarantee that these will be available for account recovery. And so possession also introduces additional friction when you try to set something up. Um, and that could be additional friction, especially compared to something that you know or something that you are. If it requires that you have access to a physical object, then it's going to be a little bit of additional friction during that setup phase. And that's something that you're probably also going to want to keep in mind. I specifically wanted to highlight one type of possession factor that we see a lot for account recovery, and that's backup or recovery codes. Um, and so these are given to you, so they're a little bit more likely to be longer and less likely to be reused. And so in that sense, they're, you know, they're a secret string that is a little bit more secure than a password. But that means that people have to store backup codes somewhere. And while some sites will give you specific options, some sites will tell you, write them down, print them out and store them in a safe place, save them in your password manager, um, email them to yourself. I think that's a reasonable option. Um, this is a screenshot from Instagram. When you set up two-factor authentication, they give you your backup codes. These backup codes are fake, but the messaging here is real. Uh, and they don't really give you any useful guidance. They just say, make sure you keep them in a safe place. And so what 
am I supposed to do with that? And while I haven't found any research on this, and please, if anybody has any research on how many people actually have access to backup codes when they need them, um, please share that with me. But my, my hunch, my hypothesis here is that most people don't actually save these. And so these become a somewhat useless form of recovery. And so like, what is the solution here? There's a debatable solution here that you could email the recovery codes to the user. That's, you know, like automatically do that, not tell the user to store them themselves, but actually email them to them. Um, of course, if they lose access to their email, then they're locked out. Or if somebody gets into their email, then all of a sudden it's not really 2FA anymore. Um, they're also screwed if that's the case, but it could be a better solution uh, for some people. And is that any better or worse than those of us who store our backup codes in our password manager? We're kind of all concentrating risk in one area. So I just have a lot of opinions about backup codes. And so this is something that I kind of wanted to call out specifically as a recovery option. Um, you know, I'm not really saying that you should start automatically emailing users your backup codes, but it might have a higher usability than whatever most people are doing today. So let's spend a little bit of time looking at a few companies and their account recovery processes. Uh, a lot of companies can be intentionally vague about this, but some have really good documentation about their processes. And some of these are companies that I've personally dealt with. Um, so let's start with a pretty questionable example. Um, so this is a financial services company that you may or may not know. I'm not going to name them. Um, they use a pretty interesting form of 2FA. It's a proprietary form of 2FA, so I can't use, you know, Authy or another authenticator app that allows backup. Um, they just as a weird aside that doesn't really have anything to do with uh, account recovery, they have you append the 2FA code at the end of your password, which is a little weird. Um, but the, the thing that annoys me about this company is that, uh, so when you get a new phone, there's not an automated process for transferring your 2FA to that new phone. You have to call the help desk of this company. Um, you know, as a millennial, of course, I hate calling anyone, but it's not just that. When you call the company to reset your two-factor authentication, what you have to do is authenticate yourself over the phone and like they don't really do any actual authentication. All they require is your username and your phone number in order to change this on your account. And so that's a little bit frustrating. It's kind of the worst of both worlds. It's not self-service online, so they're not like foregoing the extra security for usability. They're making it a little bit harder to reset this process, but it's also not even that secure. Uh, and since account recovery over the phone is so common, make sure your company is securing your contact center with the same rigor that you secure your website. Uh, this is what I spoke about last year at NorthSec, but I still think this is really important. So here's a blog post that I wrote this week about how to do call center security well. Um, so you can find that on the Twilio blog. Um, next, let's look at Authy. Uh, so we're one of those companies that we don't uh, outline in our public documentation everything that we do for account recovery, uh, but we basically require 2FA for any kind of account recovery. And so if the user has access to some of their factors, and those factors could be a backup password, a sync device, um, their mobile number, an email, uh, the process is a lot smoother. So if they lose access to one of their factors, but they still have access to at least two of their other secure factors, then the account recovery process this is going to go pretty smoothly, but we also do enforce a waiting period that can be anywhere between one to four days, depending on which factors you still have access to. And so if the user doesn't have access to some of the more important phone numbers or factors like phone numbers, then um, we consider phone number an important factor here because so much of 2FA is still done via SMS. Um, we do have additional requirements to allow them to change their phone number or regain access to the account. And so while users may be annoyed at some of these restrictions, um, people tend to be more understanding about additional frictions when it comes to security products. If you're somebody that's taken the effort to uh, sign up for an authenticator account, uh, then you're probably somebody that cares a little bit about security and is going to understand that this is something that's necessary. Next, let's look at GitHub, and GitHub is an interesting one. Fortunately, I've never had to go through the account recovery process there, but they have really extensive documentation about their 2FA setup and recovery process, and they also offer a lot of options for recovery in your account. So one option here is recovery tokens, so make sure that you save your GitHub recovery tokens somewhere. That's the easiest way to recover your account if you lose access to your, uh, your primary form of 2FA. 
they also will let you fall back to SMS if you can, if you choose to do so. You don't have to fall back to SMS, and I think that's an important distinction. Um, and that would be if you have a stronger form of 2FA enabled, like TOTP or WebAuthn. Um, they also do an interesting thing uh, where you can configure your Facebook account to store a recovery token, and this is an option that Facebook allows. Uh, you can get more information about how GitHub sets this up in their docs that I've linked here, uh, including the recover accounts elsewhere link. Um, and so that's an interesting way to kind of store a trusted token on another device. The downside of this is that they assume that you have a Facebook account. They offer plenty of other options for you if you don't have a Facebook account. Uh, but the upside here is that you're able to, you're, you know, you're probably more likely to be able to access your Facebook account than you are your GitHub account if you get locked out of that. But interestingly, I wanted to tell this anecdote. A friend of mine went through the account recovery process with GitHub and said, uh, kind of in line with this warning that's shown here, they told her that she could unlink her email address uh, so that they could use it again to create a new account, fork her stuff, and then in six months, if the old username was still dormant, they would release it to her. And so that's a pretty extreme form of a waiting period, but that is one way that they can kind of slow down the process of an attacker taking over uh, a trusted GitHub username. Um, it's pretty extreme. It's pretty unforgiving. Six month waiting period is pretty long. Um, and I don't know if that's true for all accounts. Uh, maybe their account was especially high risk, but definitely make sure that you as a, you know, somebody that might be working with uh, developers and working in code yourself have some recovery options configured on your GitHub account. Um, speaking of Facebook, though, one option for account recovery on Facebook that I wanted to highlight is somewhat unique or at least tied to the features of that product. And so Facebook is interesting because they allow you to nominate three to five friends that can confirm your identity before giving your account back to you. And so this is a pretty cool idea. If your product has a social component like Facebook, this could be a reasonable solution. I don't know if I would recommend building a social component just for this, but that could be something that if there's other reasons that you have uh, that in your product, this could be a way that you could build account recovery in. And it's also a way to think about what are the unique aspects of your product that you could use for account recovery. Um, one thing challenge here is getting users to set this up. Maybe a challenge. I'm not much of a Facebook user, uh, but I did, so I had to dig into profile settings to find this. Generally, you don't want people to have to dig into profile settings uh, to find these types of security features, but maybe they haven't prompted me for it just because I don't log on very often. So those are some examples of what different companies are currently doing. And now I want to talk through some concrete recommendations of what you can do for your company. And so the first one is that you want to have users register more factors than they need for everyday login. And so this is true both for 1FA or for 2FA. But uh, the benefit here is that you have additional trusted factors to compare against when the user loses access to one of their main login factors. Uh, and so the more factors that you have access to and the, the more factors that the user has previously registered, the more confident that you can be that the right person is trying to gain access to their account and the higher chance that the user will still have access to at least two of their factors. And so generally, if, you, if the user is logging in with 2FA, you want to make sure that you're verifying at least two factors for them to regain access to their account. Uh, so you could register these at sign up. That's you know, a pretty guaranteed way to make sure that the user has these on their account. Or it could be during a different authenticated session. That's also really common. You know, get users signed up as quickly as possible and then have them add additional security later if they start to become an active user of your site. Uh, requiring users to uh, register additional factors at sign up is going to create some additional overhead in that process. You know, if you have the notion of like a sign up or a growth team, you might want to be talking to them about how they're implementing this and how it will affect your registration numbers. But it's definitely justifiable in certain use cases. If you're doing any kind of financial services or anything that is going to have a level of fraud detection and um, in place for creating, making sure that people that sign up are real users. Uh, that's certainly a use case where you could have them register additional factors. Uh, ING Bank, for example, supports virtual video calls to verify new customers. But you know, if you're an internet retailer, you probably don't wanna be asking a user to upload a government ID. Another recommendation is that you do want to design your recovery process based on the value your business is protecting. And so this means that you want to do some threat modeling, you know, watch Alyssa's great talk from earlier on that. Look at your account takeover costs and understand how much you're actually using. 
uh, you want to make sure that you're making the right level of an investment for your business. If you're in a higher value industry, like, you know, financial services, this could mean adding that additional friction to your recovery process, but also make sure that you're considering this from your customer's perspective too. Do they understand the value of their account? So if a user is signing up for a service like Gemini, you know, a cryptocurrency exchange, that user probably is willing to opt into more security than they would for like a DoorDash account. And this is a great quote from the security researcher Cormac Hurley, where he argues that users reject a lot of good security advice, but for good reason, because a lot of security advice involves taking a lot of time, and they either don't understand that that time is a risk to them in their account that they're trying to add security measures to, uh, they don't understand that the time they might risk losing, or they might just not care. I was surveying some of my security friends about why they, what they think of backup codes. And it was interesting because there was some one person that was like, yeah, I have this uh, very detailed folder structure that I keep on a USB in a locked safe. And I was like, that's really great. I'm glad that you do that. But like, I'm not even willing to do that. I keep my backup codes in a variety of other places that is not that organized. But if that's something that me as a, somebody that thinks a lot about authentication and, you know, talks a lot about uh, authentication and has this kind of elevated paranoia compared to the average person, if I'm not willing to go to that level, that's certainly not something that I'm going to start recommending to the average person. But getting back to more recommendations, uh, you definitely want to be intentional about who you're allowing to reset to FA or if you allow people to reset to FA. And so this is along the lines of looking at your threat model. Um, definitely be intentional about this. This was a conversation that I had in Twitter DMs where I was able to get customer support to reset my account completely, turn off my 2FA. Um, and that was just by giving them my phone number and my email. And so my Twitter account, it is my full name, but that account is not tied to that profile at all. And so they might have done some validation there, but I highly doubt that they did. And I'm not saying that like this company shouldn't be letting their support team do this, but like I was wary enough of this that I don't want to tell you who this company was. And so because I'm more paranoid than the average person, uh, you know, this is something that I was like a little wary of, but from a service perspective, it was really easy to deal with. So there's that trade off that I'm not really sure like whether or not this was the right answer. Um, and also the reason that I had to reset this, this is just like completely a side note, but the reason I had to reset my 2FA code for this company is because it's not a company that I log into very frequently. Um, and I wasn't getting any 2FA codes sent to my phone. So when I was trying to log in, they were like, check your phone. We sent you an SMS. And I, I, you know, tried to do that and I just wasn't getting any SMS tokens. Uh, but it turned out that I had set up this account using Authy. And so all their 2FA messages were telling me to check my SMS messages, but they were actually not doing that because I had set up a TOTP token. And so that's just like a kind of a side that if you're one way to like help hopefully prevent a 2FA is to be clear on the messaging when you're sending 2FA tokens, make sure that you're sending them and messaging that you're sending them to the uh, channels that users actually have configured. Another thing that you can do is prompt users to confirm information that could be used for recovery when they log in. Um, and so this is one way that Twitter does that. Uh, this is the same idea behind things like security checkups and email notifications to uh, review your account. You know, I mentioned that digging into profile settings probably isn't going to be a very good way to get users to update their security settings. These types of prompts are one way to get users to either add additional factors or make sure that the factors that they have registered are up to date. Um, and these reminders are relatively cheap and easy to implement. Um, and this is especially compared to the cost of what a customer lockout or account recovery would be. Another recommendation, uh, more than general prompts, is that you can also time these reminders uh, and get specific with them. And so time them around the holidays and around new iPhone releases. This is something that, you know, from the Authy side of things, we always see uh, a higher volume of support tickets around the holidays when people get new phones and around new iPhone releases. And so that's when people are changing their phones. That's when they might get locked out. It makes a lot of sense. Like there's not really anything too crazy that's happening there. Um, but an example of this is an email I got from Zapier last week. Uh, it's just a reminder to save your recovery code so that you don't get locked out of your account. 
Um, you know, Authy used to be one of the only authenticator apps to support backups. That's no longer the case. Um, this may be less of a problem now that more authenticator apps are starting to uh, support this, this feature. Uh, and, you know, usually when you change a phone, at least in, you know, uh, a lot of Western countries, you don't change your phone number, but this is something that uh, in some countries, people, you know, don't use their phone number as the same type of identifier and don't have that kind of static identity that we, we think of here. Um, but even actually Google Authenticator just rolled out a token export feature for Android. It's not totally uh, the same as the Authenticator apps that uh, support backups, but it's, it's one way to make that process of changing 2FA tokens between phones a little bit easier. So another big thing, hopefully you're already doing this if you support 2FA, um, but you really want to make sure that you're designing your 2FA onboarding well. Um, and so in a 2018 study that focused on the usability of YubiKeys, researchers found that setup success varied a lot depending on the platform that uh, the customers were trying to log into. And so users logging into Google had an 83% success rate of enabling 2FA, but when they were trying to log into Facebook, they only had a 32% success rate of, of enabling 2FA. And one thing that's interesting is 19% of people actually locked themselves out of Windows 10 because the system allowed them to enable the factor without ever doing a successful verification. And so a lot has changed since 2018. But I think this study is a really interesting look at how onboarding UX impacts user success. And so it sounds obvious, but make sure that you your users are completing at least one successful authentication before they ever enable that factor. And finally, uh, the, the last recommendation that I have that you want to make sure you do is, is add waiting periods uh, to deter hackers and give users real time or real users time to dispute any takeover attempts. Um, remember that your solution is not going to ever perfectly prevent attacks, but in most cases, you're trying to build something that's basically going to discourage people from trying. And so like Alyssa Miller was saying earlier in her talk about threat modeling, I think the goal here is to slow down an attacker, and this is one very explicit way to do that. And this gives you as the website and as a service time to respond and protect legitimate users. So this is pretty common for high risk um, account resets. So GitHub, uh, this is their notification that account recovery may take up to three to five business days. And so because this is business days, you can assume that maybe there's like a real human that's reviewing some of these. Maybe they send these to their security team for review. I'm sure it's some kind of uh, at least semi-automated process. Uh, Gemini, which is a cryptocurrency exchange, enforces a waiting period on any kind of withdrawals just for a password reset. And so this is not even resetting, um, you know, your second factor, but this is, you know, one of the factors if you're resetting it and doing an account recovery here, they're still enforcing that waiting period. Uh, and then, you know, I just kind of wanted to throw in some ideas into the ring for debate too. You know, I already mentioned uh, automatically emailing backup codes. Really curious to see what people think about that idea. You know, we kind of talked about trusted contact authorization. Um, you know, curious to see like if people have, you know, tried this and what the downsides are. That's not something that we've decided to implement, but, you know, I think it could work for the right context. Um, you know, what about like something like linked site authorization? This is what Keybase, you know, pre-Zoom was actually trying trying to do. The idea here was that if you know my account on, you know, Foo website is the same person as my Twitter account, if you already have those linked, could I tweet something that builds some kind of trust that I am the one that's trying to log back into Foo website? Um, you know, that's certainly possible. Like, I don't know how reasonable the implementation there is. Um, and then one, one of the last things that I wanted to kind of talk about was SMS fallback. Like I've heard a lot of debates and had some debates about this, whether that's a good option for recovery of a TOTP or hardware token or whether it defeats the point. And it might defeat the point, but I think it's better than nothing. And it's probably going to lower overhead for support. And that's something that's always important to consider too. So my general advice there is like offer SMS as a fallback option, but don't make people use that as a fallback option. Uh, you want to really delight your security conscious users. And so GitHub does this, like they offer SMS as a fallback option, but you don't have to opt into that. You don't have to opt into SMS as a, as a 2FA channel if you don't trust it. Um, and of course, you know, what about blockchain? I'm just kidding. Please don't save your compute resources for something else. Um, but, you know, debate that if you want to. Uh, so, you know, I did mostly want to focus on the positives here, but I do have a couple of things that you shouldn't do. 
Um, don't, for instance, uh, let people only use one factor to regain access to accounts where they have 2FA enabled. Um, we saw a wave of account gets hacked because they were protected with a password and SMS-based 2FA. And then the attackers were able to SIM swap the, uh, the customer and bypass the password because they had a second factor, even though the users had strong passwords. And so that's something that you really want to avoid. Um, and also just like, please don't be this company. If you're going to disable the second factor on account recovery, honestly, just like don't offer 2FA. Um, at least send a fallback message to the SMS. In this case, like I did still have access to my second factor. For some reason, I just hadn't saved the password in, you know, in my uh, password manager. And finally, don't let this discourage you. There's a lot of ways that you can think about designing this, but don't give up on 2FA. Um, this Google research shows that even SMS codes sent uh, to a recovery phone number help prevent 76% of targeted attacks and up to 100% of automated bots. So this is really good coverage and can protect a lot of people from account takeover. Just put a little bit of thought into designing this process and you'll be golden. So like everything, this will depend on your business. Um, but here are some of the things that you might want to monitor as you adjust your 2FA onboarding, as you adjust your user experience and think about designing that and how you do recovery. Um, definitely be friends with your support team and make sure that you're aligned on how much friction you're forcing your users to endure because support costs may go up as a result of adding additional factors, as a result of adding additional security to your authentication process, but that's okay if it's actually decreasing the uh, relative amount of compromised accounts or the losses that you're suffering from account takeover. So I really hope that this talk is giving you some ideas for how to think about uh, your account recovery processes. Again, my biggest thing here is that you, you know, there's not a right answer here, but I really just want you to think about it. Think about what's right for your business. Think about what's right for your users and adjust uh, accordingly and introduce the right level of friction. So if you have any questions, uh, please add them to the Slido uh, or you can reach out to me on Twitter. This is my Twitter handle. Uh, once again, my name is Kelly Robinson and thank you for listening. All right. The first question is from a bravely named user, Godel, I think. Um, how is email a solid solution to store backup codes? If email is down, everything will go with it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I didn't say it was a solid solution. I said it was a solution. Uh, and so like with everything, like you're going to have to balance that against how usable it is. The benefit of that is that users are probably more likely to have access to their email account than they would to whatever piece of paper they printed out when they originally like store their backup codes. And so like, this is one of those things that like, I don't have the answer here. I don't know if there is a good answer for backup codes. Uh, I really want somebody to do this study. Maybe I'll just have to, you know, work with somebody in academia to design that myself. But uh, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's a lot of benefits of like uh, usability in these solutions. And so that's something that you're just gonna have to decide whether or not you wanna take the risk there. Gotcha. All right. So next one, if I sum it up, register three plus factors for 2FA, right? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> um, all right. At this one, I'm actually very interested in myself. Um, should we roll our own 2FA or use a third party provider? Or maybe if I can rephrase that, if, if, if I may, um, what are the risks of rolling your own? Yeah, I mean, it depends on what you mean by roll your own. So it depends, there's like some factors that are gonna be a lot easier to uh, implement yourselves. Like there's a lot of libraries out there in most uh, major languages for doing things like TOTP. Um, you know, but that's something that's a somewhat complicated solution. Like you're going to have to start dealing with things like time drifts and uh, what you do when somebody gets locked out of it. Uh, obviously, I am biased since I work for a security vendor that offers 2FA. But the thing that you're going to have to keep in mind is that a lot of channels like, you know, SMS, you're going to have to outsource the actual sending of the messages anyway. And so, uh, you know, one of the benefits that people end up coming to us for is because Twilio offers that, you know, kind of as a built-in solution. And so, uh, yeah, definitely like look at your options and see how many people you have available to support this. Like anything that's with a build versus buy situation, like uh, you 
probably will have to do less configuration if you and less code if you buy you know or at least partially buy a solution or an api like we offer but um the risk to building your own is that you're going to have to think about a lot more edge cases uh and then you're going to have to probably have more people around to support those and also support people when they you know get locked out one of the one of the other reasons that you know like a company like twitch ends up coming to uh, us for their two FA is that you, we we support the uh, end user support when they get locked out of their accounts where they're you know they end up calling Twilio's account security team or Twilio's support team instead of Twitch's support team. That makes a lot of sense. Never have I ever been screwed over by a uh, time drift. Um, all right. Um, so next one. Um, how widespread is hardware token support? So you see this a lot more with internal like enterprise uh, employee security right now. Um, it's, you know, hardware tokens are, are based on top of something like FIDO2 or U2F or WebAuthn, which are all like vaguely under the same umbrella of support. Um, and not every device like, or not every, website has support for that yet. And so it's not super widespread, especially on the consumer side, but like you will start to see this a lot more with, um, you know, internal employees uh, support and that kind of thing. And that's because it's a lot easier for the account recovery, honestly. So if you lose your hardware security key, like there's not like a lot of good ways to get past that if you want to make sure that that's something that is used to log you into an account. And so what a lot of people end up recommending is that you get two hardware tokens. And so you essentially have the same factor and then a backup duplicate of it that you would keep in an account or something. And that's, excuse me, that's going to be something that's really hard to get a lot of consumers to do because there's a lot of overhead in setting that up. And, you know, there is a huge risk there. Um, if somebody loses that token, like, are you going to let them use a different factor for um, recovering that if they don't have access to that? So the the short answer is it's not very widespread on the consumer side yet. I think that will start to change as more devices that we already have, like our phones, adopt the WebAuthn standard. Uh, Google started doing this with Android phones, but right now, as far as I know, uh, Android phones are only able to be a WebAuthn uh, compatible authenticator for Google websites. Gotcha. Um, so, uh, Sari asks, um, location can be an unseen factor. For example, when I went on holiday and wanted to log on to an app on another device, it wouldn't let me do that. How can users be informed? So there's a lot of these types of like silent authenticators that are starting to be introduced. And this is, can be part of like a biometric type authenticator that's basically using things about who or where you are to try to suss out whether or not that's something that we are uh, comfortable with letting you have access to things. Um, the problem with these is that you, they're not transparent to the users, and so users can't really configure the settings around these. Um, you know, we see some exceptions to that, right? Like bank fraud is a good example where uh, you can tell your bank, hey, I'm going to be traveling to X country for the next two weeks. Like if you see activity on my card there, don't like turn it off. But outside of banking, I don't know of a ton of examples where um, companies let you explicitly like give permission for that. And so that's going to be something that's challenging from the user management side of this. Um, the other problem here is like, there's just like less, uh, you know, we, we don't have as much um, confirmation on this yet about whether some of these biometric authenticators, like there's some debate about like whether voice recognition is a good use case or a good authenticator for, we see this a lot in like over the phone support. Um, people are trying to use this to help like save time uh, in phone support, but uh, there's also been studies that things like voice recognition are proven to be racist. And so is that a good option if you're going to be discriminating against the set of your users? Might not be. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. I think we have time for one last one. It seems to dovetail with a bunch of the other ones that I've seen. Um, what about FIDO U2F? So this is kind of what I was talking about with hardware security keys. So this is, um, you know, U2F is the universal second factor. And I think where we'll start to see more of this uh, converge is in FIDO2, it, the whole 
uh, goal around using web Auth as a factor is that we want to replace passwords. And so we still might have two factor authentication, um, but those pa the, the major factors that we're going to be using will no longer include a password. And so um, I don't know if like U2F is going to be the term that we're going to be using going forward. I think, you know, just for semantic purposes, web off end and is going to be like what we'll be seeing a lot more of. And to that point, like I think as the devices that we already have, like our phones start to become trusted authenticators, like we'll start to see that pick up a lot more because I'm not as likely to like lose my iPhone as I would be uh, likely to, you know, lose a hardware security key that I only use to log into a handful of websites, perhaps. And so the the challenge there is like, how do you set the backup? How do you register another trusted secure factor uh, in case somebody does lose their phone? Because that's something that, you know, we definitely have to deal with right now and giving some level of control to the user of what they want to uh, allow as a trusted backup and trusted recovery device in the case of a lost phone is going to be something that I think we'll have to start uh, explicitly giving users control over when they register those factors. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Um, thanks so much for being here again. Uh, wish it could have been physically in Montreal. Um, it's been a really great talk and thanks for closing out uh, the afternoon, evening, uh, whatever time is at this point uh, in Thank such an awesome me. way. I uh, really appreciate it.